Hello everyone, Craig Dunkerley here and welcome to the Beyond Growth Show. I'm here as always with the wonderful Claudia Harvey. Hello everybody, my pleasure being here today. And Craig, who's our guest today? Today's guest is Sue Phillips, internationally renowned fragrance expert. She was the marketing director for Lacombe Paris, VP of Tiffany & Company, in addition to creating fragrances for A-list celebrities. I am so excited to have Sue come on. I met Sue during the IOATP conference at the International Association of Top Professionals conference. Um, we were supposed to meet in person at a gala in New York and of course we couldn't this past year so we had a Zoom and it was fascinating talking to her and I'm very very excited to bring her on as a guest today. So yeah. but before we start let's remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube and Spotify channels and please comment and click the bell for any updates to the videos. Excellent, and I'm expecting it to be another great show. But we, before we continue, Claudia always likes to start off with something positive. I am so excited to say in two days it's springtime. And as viewers and listeners know that we are in Toronto, which is an Arctic tundra <laughs> for a big part of the year. And I really look forward to springtime and the very first birds are starting to um, surface and sit in the trees outside my office. And it's, uh, it's I'm, I love spring. So two yeah. days, it's springtime. Same here. Always my favorite time of the year because we're moving into such sunshine through spring and summer and winter is so far away. Mm -hmm. Let's bring on Sue. Hi, Sue. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Great to see you. Great to see you too, Sue. So, Sue, you and I connected through the International Association of Top Professionals, and they're based out of New York City. Are you in New York, Sue? Yes, I'm in Manhattan. And you won a recent award. Yes, I and did. And what was that award? Um, top International Marketing um, Award, Professional Marketing, which is uh, a real honor and um, so excited to have won that and to have been even nominated, which is um, quite quite a, an honor. Well, congratulations. That's wonderful. Very, very nice. Um, I know that we were chatting over Christmas. We had our, you know, the group of us was having our annual Christmas gala. Unfortunately, it wasn't a gala. It was a virtual meeting, you know, with a cup of wine or a glass of wine in our hands. So, you know, we were chatting about it, intimately about each other's backgrounds and stuff. And I thought your background was so fascinating, Sue. So tell, if, if you don't mind, can I ask you a little bit about how you got into doing what you're doing? Well, you know, in life, everything can be serendipitous. And uh, the fact that I got into the fragrance industry was really quite um, uh, remarkable because I had always wanted to be a singer and an actress. And when I came to America, I, at the time, I didn't have a green card. I wasn't a citizen and I didn't, I wasn't a member of the unions, the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, but uh, because I am passionate about things that I do, I landed up eventually um, doing some comedy work and singing and acting at night. And when I got my green card, I went to um, a headhunter and I landed up uh, having a job interview at several companies. One of them was Elizabeth Arden, and they loved the fact that I could stand up in front of people and speak and perform. And they were looking for a national training director for the fragrance division. So that's how I landed up in the cosmetic industry, quite wow. by chance. Wow, it is. Um, so, Sue, it's, it's interesting because your training as an actress allowed you to get into the corporate world. Yes, and who would have thought that? Um, the fact that, you know, just standing up and performing and motivating people and allowing them to listen to what I had to say would actually land me this terrific opportunity in the corporate world. Wonderful. Yeah, that's that's really that's really interesting. And you know how one thing that you're focused on all of a sudden takes you somewhere else. 
And, and we understand that working in the fragrance world, you've actually created scents. And what got you interested while you were working in this space to actually creating scents? Well, when I was training, uh, when I was the training director at Elizabeth Arden, from there I went to Lancome as marketing director, and then from there to Tiffany as vice president of marketing. Wow. wow. So I just have to pause. <laughs> that is so cool. You're a marketing director at Tiffany, one of vice president of marketing. Vice, vice president, one of the most prestigious brands on Fifth Avenue. Well, you know, if you'd have told me growing up in South Africa that one day I would have this incredible opportunity to really define the fragrance di direction of this iconic corporate brand, this global brand, uh, I would just say that, you know, you're crazy because who would have thought that? Um, but, you know, it's very interesting. So I've always loved fragrance. As a little girl, I loved fragrance. When my mother would leave at night to go out, she would kiss me and her fragrance would linger in the air. So I always felt a source of comfort when um, she had, you know, gone out and I still felt her aura and her presence around me. Right. And, you know, having worked at Elizabeth Arden and then to Lancome and then at Tiffany, I just realized how incredible fragrance can make people feel it can change your life it can make you feel confident and sensual and and so i started not only loving the idea of talking about fragrance and marketing it but then when things change and i left tiffany to have my daughter to really start thinking about well how can i make a difference in the world and that's when i started my own business and i created custom fragrances well, just interesting, interesting evolution. Can I can I go back to, and again, this might be a tangent, Sue, but can I go back to, so Tiffany obviously is known today for the jewelry. Yes. It is an iconic brand, as you said. They started out with jewelry and then they moved into fragrance. And you were probably in the evolution of bringing the fragrance to market and marketing that whole new channel that this iconic company was doing. How challenging is that? Really challenging because, you know, Tiffany as a brand, and it's gone through many uh, iterations actually. Um, so Tiffany was known as the jewelry company, you know, the little blue box, of course. And anything that you got in the little blue box, whether it was a silver keychain or a pen or a magnificent piece of jewelry, was very special because of that little blue box and they were never known for fragrance and um, I was hired uh, to spearhead and develop the fragrance for their 150th anniversary and so they had started to work on it and by the time they hired me they wanted to really um, launch it and so I was you know given the missive to help develop create the fragrance and to really launch it which was uh, wonderful so it was different because at that time, Tiffany wasn't in the fragrance industry. And this mm -hmm. was in the late 90s, uh, excuse me, the late 80s, when fragrance was just so big and so bold and so popular. And it was all the celebrities were coming out with fragrances. So it had to be very special. And the thing that was important to me was the hallmark of Tiffany was the quality. So the quality of the ingredients had to be and had to reflect the image and the ethos of Tiffany. And so for me, understanding the different quality um, that can be, you know, developed for fragrance is important. I liken it to wine, you know, um, or champagne. You can have fantastic champagne, but cheap champagne will give you a really bad headache. <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing, too. But some people absolutely find that that horrible scent gives them headaches. Yes. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I have felt very, uh, very, very sort of cognizant of how fragrances can uh, help you feel and make you feel. And that quality is important. You don't want to have people wear a fragrance that's going to give them headaches and allergies. And sadly, in the last, I would say the last five to 10 years, uh, wherever I go, I do hear from people saying, oh, the fragrances these days give headaches and allergies. And it's a sad commentary, but um, it's it's something that has to be addressed by the industry. And so I feel that the fragrances that we develop 
are very high quality. They're very natural. And in the 10 years or 12 years since I've been doing my own custom fragrance portion of my life and my career, I have never had anybody get headaches or allergies from my fragrances. Cool. So I, I, I find it very interesting that you mention it's about how a fragrance makes someone feel. Uh, just like yourself, I've heard Claudia numerous times smell a fragrance in the air and it makes her think of her mom as well. So mm -hmm. it, it's very, very interesting, I find, that, that a fragrance can move somebody to those, to those thoughts, to those moments, to those times in their life. So could you briefly describe the process involved in creating a signature scent for a famous brand? And, and does it start with a vision of how the fragrance is supposed to make people feel? That's such a great question. So the absolute sort of process or process, as I like to say, is with the core aspect. What is the ethos of that brand? What is the sort of direction and the core values of whether it's a brand or a designer or a celebrity for the fragrance? And it's really developing the idea and the fragrance based around that core image. So if you're a if you're sort of a very iconic brand that has you know 150 years worth of history, you want to have something that has a classic feel, and you don't want anything too trendy. So a fragrance that has a classic feel could have beautiful uh, um, floral notes, a beautiful woodsy note, some ambery spicy notes that gives it a feeling of sophistication, quality, and classic feeling it would be very bad for a, a fragrance or a, a brand of that sort of ilk to come out with a very trendy, sporty, kind of fruity, young fragrance, which is typically figured out, you know, marketed and positioned to young people. So it's how fragrances make you feel. And certain fragrances give a feeling of sophistication, of sensuality, uh, maybe sportiness, maybe a little young, and so knowing which ingredients would work well with the brand ethos, we then figure it out. So it's all, it, it is uh, definitely a cycle. Um, there is a, a big process about going through it. Um, I ask a lot of questions. I, uh, in my business, I give people a personality quiz or a questionnaire. Um, it's really exploring and understanding the brand attributes. So something like, you know, a fragrance like Tiffany or a really high-end, um, say, um, luxury brand, we would explore all those elements and then say, okay, well, these are the areas that we feel would work well for that brand. Now, one of the things that's important is not to reflect one's own individuality and one's own individual preferences. You know, if, if I hate florals, but florals are the right direction for the brand, then I have to overcome that and work towards the core value of the brand. Right. And that, that uh, having worked on brands myself, that is so important. You start with, and I really need to get this across. I'd like to, and, and Sue, you're, you're very eloquent in saying it because it starts with what the company core values are, yes. what they believe they are in the marketplace. And then it's kind of reverse engineering what that product that they want to bring to market would meet that need in the market. Absolutely. And yeah. Claudia, as you know, every aspect has to be consistent. Mm -hmm. The marketing, the packaging, the, mm -hmm. the advertising, even you know, the distribution. Um, if you have a high-end luxury brand, you want it in a high-end luxury distribution channel. You don't want it in the mass market yeah. areas. So everything has to be very consistent. And one of the things that I actually developed was, um, I actually developed a... Um, I, I have all these PowerPoint presentations, but I call it a wheel of fortune where every aspect of the brand has to be consistent. And I can, I can show that to you if you'd like. That, that is so, that is really, really cool. And even talking about where the product that's coming to market is going to be in distribution. Is it going to be in mass market? Is it going to be online? Is it going to be, um, you know, in a, just a general drugstore? Is it only going to be in your stores? All of that takes into account. And how long did it take for Tiffany from inception of, oh, I think we want to do a fragrance to going to market? How long did that take? About two years. Wow. 
Wow. And you worked with chemists, you worked with, how do you even find the ingredients? <laughs> uh, we work with um, perfumers and labs, and that was actually a very interesting direction because, you know, Tiffany was not known for fragrance. And no. so at the time we did a joint venture with Chanel and Chanel, of course, is a luxury brand. It had its own chief perfumer. And so I worked with the chief perfumer, Jacques Pauge, uh, and went to Paris and developed uh, the fragrance with him. Uh, obviously, we knew what Tiffany was, a high-end luxury quality brand, uh, which was going to be positioned for women initially. Uh, it was the woman's fragrance that was launched first. And so it was such a joy to you know, work with him because of course he is a legend in the industry. And we came up with the beautiful fragrance, um, which we had the working name of Bellissima, which is, means very beautiful in Italian. And um, when we actually did a focus group and we did a test um, with the Tiffany, we, there were some other submissions. It, it's never just one submission along the the, the development time period, there were several submissions developed by different companies that we finally narrowed down. And um, I said that I'd like to, you know, invite the Tiffany customer, the clientele to come in and to actually help determine the direction of the fragrance. There were three final submissions and um, we invited the Tiffany customer to come in and we invited them to come into the blue box, so to speak. Oh. And Sprayed one fragrance here, one fragrance there, and one fragrance here. So they were able to evaluate it. And hands down, the fragrance that we developed with Jacques was the, the winner. I would have loved to be part of that focus group. It was so <laughs> much fun. <laughs> oh. I'm sure you would have. I, I want to, can I, can I go back for a second, Sue? Um, we talk about brands all the time and the importance of your brand and, and protecting your brand. And you talked about creating a fragrance scent that fit with the brand that you were creating it for. Would you agree that it's also important for the business or the individual that's choosing a fragrance for themselves to match their brand? And I kind of bring this up because, you know, I know one of Claudia's favorite scents, not for wearing, but just scents, is the scent that you get that you get when you walk into a Four Seasons hotel. Mm -hmm. Right. She absolutely loves that scent. And whenever um, she she smells it, it just brings her back to the comfort of a four season hotel. Just so luxury and yeah, yeah, luxury. Yeah. So so the, the fragrance creation is obviously important to fit the brand of the company creating it. But then again, would you agree that the brands that are using it need to choose the right fragrance for their brand as well or as as individuals? Absolutely. And that's why it's so important to do our due diligence ahead of time. So we call that, uh, Claudia, when you go into a hotel and you, you try it and smell a fragrance in the air, we call it ambient scenting, environmental scenting, where you walk into a hotel and you're, you know, you're, you discover the beautiful aroma wafting in the air. Well, it's done with with a great deal of uh, foresight. It's not just, you know, by chance that it happens. Right. So we work with companies and to develop a fragrance for the brand essence itself, um, whether it's a modern hotel or if it's a very classic hotel, or if it's a, 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 a hotel in Las Vegas. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, that's where scent branding started in Las Vegas 25 or 35 years ago, to overcome the smoke odors in the casinos. Oh. Right. So they would pump the fragrance into the air to give it a refreshing smell. And ultimately they said, well, let's put some fragrance in there. And, and that's why the, the, the brand scent in some of these hotels uh, become very synonymous with the hotel. So yes, it's all about the brand, the individual, it's the core, the core um, uh, reflection of that brand. And it's also, you know, also for, for, for people, for individuals, you know, when people meet with me at my perfume studio, we give them a scent personality questionnaire to determine what fragrance family direction they like. Do they like fresh fragrances or florals or woodsy or spicy? And uh, you might think some, all women love florals. Well, all women don't particularly like florals, but for some reason. And so it's really interesting that the, the scent personality questionnaire that they take reveals that they might not like florals. And so we then create a fragrance for them based on their answers and based on their individuality so that everything that they wear is custom created for them. 
Well, I cannot wait to be able to come down to New York and do that with you, Sue. I cannot wait. I would love personally to have a signature scent. I think that's so fascinating. Um, do you do you work with people? Do you have to have them like beside you in your studio or do you work with people all over the world? I work with people all over the world. So in the background, you see my perfume table. Those are the 18 yeah. blends that I have actually created. But the interesting thing is that we're not obviously because of the pandemic and everything that we are doing so many Zoom sessions and um, online sessions where people can uh, sign up and take our scent quiz. I evaluate the quiz. We do a consultation. We go through the results. And then based on their results and based on the interaction that we've had, I can actually create a custom fragrance for you. So um, you don't necessarily have to meet with me in person. The wonderful thing is about meeting in person is that you get to evaluate every single fragrance. Right. Um, but I've also developed a little kit so people can, you know, uh, identify and evaluate what do florals smell like? What do fresh scents smell like? So we go through the kit and then uh, I've actually have created a fragrance for men and women. It's basically for men and women. It's not just women. Uh, so I have to ask something, Sue. Like you're meeting with many people and, you know, their questionnaire kind of guides you on what they like. Have you found that in some cases you've got somebody who likes floral, but the brand that you recognize they're trying to create for themselves, they should be going in a different direction. Do you find you have to point people into different types of scents and what they actually think they like? Or do you adapt uh, a scent in the floral that they like that would work for them and their brand? I think the second because right. um, interestingly enough, you know, if 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 it, 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 it's really all about the, the, the individual, for instance, um, you know, you might think that many men wouldn't want a flower. Well, many men do like flowers. And so not necessarily steering them away from a flower, but I wouldn't give a very heavy, seductive, sweet flowers for a man I'd give more of a gentle flower right. um, which has actually happened quite a few times some men uh, evaluate the fragrances and uh, they do happen to like a gentle flower so yes I do I do sort of um, narrow it down and, and skew it for the person for the individual based on their um, either their DNA their chemistry or their preferences right well, I, you know what, my, we always talk about goals on our Beyond Growth podcast show. My goal, I'm hoping, is to meet with you in New York. I'm in Toronto. You're in New York, not too far away. Can't go across border right now. Right. But my goal is to meet with you in 2021 and do this in person. And if I can't, I will still do this with you because it sounds so fascinating. It's great. I would love to, Claudia. Absolutely. And you too, Craig. Um, it would be so wonderful to meet in person. And uh, it would be wonderful just to continue our conversations, you know, online and in person. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Your background is so diverse. You talk about working with such stellar people in extremely high-end brands. What I also was really interesting when, and just want to touch base upon is that you, Tiffany, worked in theory with a competitor to create the signature scent of Tiffany. And a lot of people don't think that they can actually work in um, a network that is competitive. But so how, how did that even come about? Well, that's a great question too. So, you know, understanding that at the time, um, well, Tiffany wasn't in the fragrance business. And because um, we wanted to have a luxury fragrance and a luxury brand. Um, the management at the time um, were discussing a joint venture and uh, we then landed up working with Chanel. Uh, they loved it because it was you know, associated with the luxury American brand. Uh, Tiffany loved it because it was working with the luxury um, French brand. And um, it, was, it was a marriage made in heaven. Um, and there are many joint ventures that are done maybe behind the scenes, mm -hmm. but it has to also work authentically. You know, you really can't have um, a luxury brand going to a, a mass brand and say, okay, make a fragrance for me. Although sadly that is what's happening these days. Many luxury brands license their names to companies and they, you know, are not luxury brands. So at that time it was, um, 
it was quite uh, quite a, a wonderful joint venture. Mm -hmm. Oh, it sounds wonderful. So you also worked at Lancome as yeah. well. Yes. And you were in Paris in Lancome. Yes. No, I worked in New York, but for Lancome, and we, it, it was Lancome Paris. But I was in Paris very, very often, um, obviously for fragrance development. And also, I developed at that time <clears throat> a men's uh, uh, a men's line called Programme Homme, like Programme Homme for men, uh, because at the time, <coughs> excuse me, Lancome was not in the men's business, and they wanted to get into the men's treatment business because Lancome was very much uh, a treatment and skincare brand. Mm -hmm. And fragrance was such a small percent of their overall business. They said, Sue, we know how passionate you are about fragrance, but it's, you know, we want to give you something, you know, a bigger, you know, profile and uh, portfolio. So they asked me to help develop the men's uh, brand, which I did. So I was in Paris quite often. Fascinating. No, you mentioned that Lancome, of course, is skincare. Like people know Lancome for skincare. Um, scents go into creams and soaps, and that is very deliberate as well, correct? And that yeah. also goes back to the brand of the the whole company. Is that true? So a lot of time, yes. Um, you know, the thing is with skincare, you don't skincare um, formulations will have a fragrance in it, but not so much as a fragrance, but more as a masking agent. Because some of the creams have a certain ingredient aroma that might not be so appropriate for a skincare cream. So we would put in a masking agent and that will then give the sort of feeling of a refreshing cream or a calming, soothing cream or lotion, but typically skincare should be fragrance free. Uh, and that's why so many skincare companies, you know, uh, position and market and advertise their pro uh, products as fragrance free or allergy free. Right, right. And I guess that is important mm -hmm. because you add different ingredients and the um, you know, incident rate of, of allergies probably goes up. Yes, exactly. Right. right. Um, so where do you like working the best in the world? It sounds like you have been everywhere. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I love what I do. I'm so grateful that I found this niche business, um, creating custom fragrances for people. And the truth of the matter is one can work anywhere. Um, I work in New York. I had a lovely perfume studio um, in Tribeca oh. for, for eight years. Uh, and sadly, due to the pandemic, um, they landed up uh, closing the building and selling the building. So I have found a beautiful new boutique, which is where I'm at now, um, in the Vanessa Knoll Shoe Boutique on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. Lovely. And um, I, you know, when I travel, I can meet with clients or talk to clients online. Uh, but I do love New York, I have to say. I love Manhattan. Um, it's, it gives me the energy and it gives me the vibrancy that I love. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a joy and I, I feel so grateful. I've, I've actually been in Manhattan uh, and in America longer than I ever was in South Africa. So I'm an American far longer than I was a South African. <laughs> right. Um, well, I may, and I want to bring something to our viewers and our listeners. You have such a diverse background. Obviously, you've worked with you know all around the world, but you are also a mom. You yeah. shifted your stellar, incredible career to balancing life with children. Can you tell us about that? Because I know there's a lot of viewers that want to hear about that. Well, when I was at Tiffany, I um, had my daughter, and I there were some complications medically, and I realized that you know working and full-time uh, was a little stressful and I was advised to take it easy. Mm -hmm. But being a very ambitious and career-minded person, I didn't want to give up work. So that's when I, I, after I had my daughter, I started my own consulting company, which I called Centerprises. And um, my daughter was my focus and, and has, is amazing. She is, um, a wonderful young woman. And I will tell you that I just spoke to her last night. Uh, she now lives in Europe. She was, um, she had applied for the Peace Corps 
and she went to the Peace Corps as a volunteer about seven or eight years ago, and she went to Romania, Moldova. I didn't even know where Moldova was at the time. And then she was given a, uh, awarded a Fulbright scholarship and she was in Bucharest and she started to work in the area of uh, anti-human trafficking. And she has evolved to such an extent that she's now working in the area of leadership training, experiential learning, and she's now working for the UN. She is um, doing amazing work. And so when I speak with her, usually by Zoom or Skype or late nights on the phone, uh, I'm so thrilled for her. And I think what I'm so proud of uh, about her is that she really um, has become her own person. You know, I always said to her, uh, be your own person. Don't ever rely on anybody, not a man, a husband, a boyfriend, a friend, for your, you know, for your pro progress. Uh, take advice and take help, but remember it's up to you. And she has done that and she's doing remarkably well. I like to say she's changing the world and I'm making it smell good. <laughs> oh, that is so wonderful, Sue. I think that's wonderful. I think the, the balance of a lot of women trying to to balance their career. And you said something that is that speaks to me. I, I have three kids too. And I gave up my corporate career in amazing companies to also try and balance my children's lives. And But I didn't want to give up my career. I didn't want to give up stimulation that I was really enjoying. Um, so, and it's amazing that she didn't actually go into business because you are such a business person. Even though you just sense you're such a business person. And she, you encouraged her to do her own thing yes well you know I was never basically taught and I was never really sort of on a business path on a career of you know business I, I was always in the arts I was always going to be in theater and singing and my mother was an amazing artist uh, and a calligraphist from South Africa so I never really had business in my in my sort of uh, you know my my fear of of uh, work and it was just as I said in the beginning it was serendipitous that I landed up in that way and uh, I think that when you are one is given challenges and one is given choices the choices you make and the challenges that you face sort of do steer you towards your next step and so I always feel that I'm just um, I'm so grateful I'm so I'm excited about what I do because it's it, it's up to me now. You know, I'm not in a big corporation, but I work with corporations. But I love the fact that I'm a an entrepreneur, and I call myself a entrepreneur. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did hear Sue that actually you do have a your next step, as you just said, next steps uh, in actually launching a new book this spring. So, can you tell us about yes. the book? So I'm very excited. I wanted to write a book for a long time. And um, I, I was grappling with the idea of, you know, my background and my, my life and, you know, a memoir. Well, and I said, well, who cares about a memoir? <laughs> it's, uh, uh, but the idea of perfume, you know, over the years, I've spoken at so many uh, functions and expos and written so many articles. And, the, 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 the notion of how fragrance can make one feel was very important to me. So I started to pen a book and uh, I've written a book and it was supposed to be launched last year, but because of, and so because of the pandemic, uh, everything was delayed and, and just things happened. Just then I had to move my studio and, you know, all kinds of delays happened. And so um, we're actually going to be launching it this, uh, publishing it this spring. And I'm very excited. It's called The and Power what, of Perfume. What's the, what's the title? The Power of Perfume. How to choose it, wear it and enjoy it. I, I will be one of the first people to buy it, Sue. It sounds wonderful. Just Thanks. fantastic. Amazing. You know, I, I love to write. I've always written articles and, and, and it's just an expression of, of how I feel and how um, I think fragrance makes one feel. And so I, I'm very fortunate to be able to express myself in a way that is sort of compelling that people want to read things. I've written articles and I just felt it was time to do something like that. So I'm very excited about that. Well, it's wonderful. So you can, we can tell that you absolutely love what you do and you're so fortunate to have, have found a, a calling like that. So it's just wonderful. Um, 
I think our time is up today, but I thank you so much for being on our show. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I look forward to meeting you in person in New York, hopefully in 2021. Um, and do you want to leave any thoughts with our viewers and listeners about yeah. what you do? And I also just want to say thank you so much uh, to both of you for this opportunity. It's so lovely to meet you online and I hope to meet you in person. I would say to people, you know, um, Fragrance can really make a difference in your life, whether it's a candle, whether it's a room spray, whether it's scented sticks. You know, um, one of the things that people don't really know about is the different sort of uh, uh, ingredients. And so what I say is go to the supermarket when you're looking at the produce, smell the difference between a lemon and an orange and a tangerine and a mandarin. And just all those notes will just sort of make you really understand the essence and the beauty of, in, of different ingredients. So open your mind, your heart, and your nose to different fragrances. And why wear what everybody else wears when you can create your own and you can express your own individuality. So um, my mission I, is to create beautiful fragrance experiences drop by drop. That's so that, that sounds wonderful. So I, I absolutely know what I'm doing next time I go to the grocery store. So thank there you. you for that. <laughs> but before we sign off, uh, I'm sure there's a number of people who are listening or watching today. And what's the best way to get a hold of you? I'm sure there's numbers of them that would love to connect with you. Well, I would love to hear from people. So um, if you Google or contact Sue Phillips fragrance, uh, I will be under suephillips.com. And that's double L, two L's. My company name is Centerprises, S-C-E-N-T-E-R-P-R-I-S-E-S, -E -E Enterprises with Cent in the beginning, Centerprises. And I'm sure if you find, if you Google Sue Phillips Fragrance, you'll find me. And it would be my pleasure to find people and to meet people. Also online, uh, Instagram, Centfully Sue, The Real Sue Phillips and Centerprises. Lovely. That's wonderful. I'm sure there's going to be a number of people reaching out to you. So, with that, you so with that, that ends our segment for today. Thank you so much for joining us, Sue, and everybody watching and listening. This concludes our podcast episode. But before we go, we'd like to leave you with a quote. So here's a closing quote that is apropos for today. Are you ready? Okay. Smell is a potent wizard that transports you across thousands of miles in all the years you have lived. Who said that? Helen Keller. Oh, yes, absolutely. Makes sense, uh, right? Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Very and she's absolutely right, because it is our most powerful sense after sight. Mm -hmm. And it's one sense that connects memory, emotion, and, you know, even taste and scent. So I, I, yeah. I totally agree. As you mentioned, you've talk, talked about your mom a couple of times. My mom had a specific scent. If sometimes I, she's passed away 10 years ago, but I've opened up a box and I still smell her scent. Right. Transports me back to a beautiful, wonderful, happy childhood. So I guess that's great. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, there's the lovely memories to think about. Um, um, <clears throat> okay, so, again, well, thank you, Sue. And before we sign great. off, our next guest is Dr. Joy Kong, regenerative medicine physician, educator, product developer, entrepreneur, and author of Tiger of Beijing. Dr. Kong will be sharing her insights on transformative medicine. And please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to our podcast channel. And if you're watching us on YouTube, hit the notification bell to get updates on our latest podcast. Thank you again, Sue. It is an absolute pleasure having you on. It's wonderful to meet you. Be well, be happy, smell well, smell good, and enjoy a fragrant day. You as well. Thank you, Thank Sue. You. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.